That's, of course, going to be the answer to waking up, is to get a closer and closer and closer connection to the Holy Spirit, and get more and more and more finely tuned into discerning, because it's like you're, in this world, you're in a maze where you've got, or a labyrinth where you've got to make all these turns every day. And you're not sure if you're making the right turns. You know, just like the mouse that's in the labyrinth, you know, is doing its best to kind of get out and escape the labyrinth, but it's not quite sure, and that's why it can take quite a lot of time to get out of a maze or a labyrinth. But the more tuned in you get to the Holy Spirit, in a very deep, authentic way, the Holy Spirit can really give you very specific guidance. You know, we were talking about that in the car last night, and we talked about that here yesterday. Go here, go there, do this, stop doing that, call so-and-so. You know, it can be very specific. And of course that's going to save time, because then you don't have to rely on your past learning to evaluate uh, try to evaluate what is the best thing I can do based on all my past history and everything I've learned from my upbringing and my education and my life experiences. You can say, hmm, okay, that's all that, and now I've got the Holy Spirit with me who can use the symbols of the past, but in a way that will guide me out of the maze. In fact, I would say the more willing you become, it's like seem to glide and flow much more easily through the maze, and at some point it's almost like you're lifted up, you know, like the old days of the rapture, <laughs> where all of a sudden you have these mystical experiences and you're, you're lifted up and you look down on the maze and you go, oh, wow, cool, I'm not there anymore, I'm not in it, I'm not stuck in the maze anymore, I'm a, a course calls it above the battleground that the only way you can find true peace is to be above the battleground. You have to have a higher perspective in looking on the world in order to have consistent peace. And Jesus says, you cannot find peace on the battleground. So this again gets more into those subtle reinterpretations of, I have heard people use that quote from the Bible, be in the world but not of it. And all I'm saying is when you work with the Course, you have to be very careful of what your interpretation of be in the world but not of it is, because as long as you still feel identified in the world, identified with the dream figure, identified with, you know, the images, and, and you have a lot of charges and meaning around those images, then the peace of mind isn't going to be consistent. You still find yourself reacting and responding to certain people, places, and even situations we talked about yesterday, that situations are artificial constructs that the ego made up to chop time and space into little increments and say, oh, in this situation with my husband, or in this situation with my daughter, or this situation with my Course in Miracles group, situational thinking is part of the problem too. It, it goes that deep, that when you start to align with the Holy Spirit, your mind starts to feel much more abstract and then even those thoughts about various situations that tend to arise in consciousness, those start to dissolve and disappear and evaporate because you start to get more of an experience that you are indeed everywhere, that you are literally not defined in a human body and by a small little band of human experiences, that literally your mind was created by God and it's vast and it's expansive. So if you work with the Course long enough, then certain passages start to come out, like, like in the workbook. Uh, when I am healed, I am not healed alone, is one of the uh, workbook lessons. And in that lesson, he says, when you accept the gift of healing, legions upon legions will arise with you. Arise with me? Yes, you are the Savior of the world, not personally, you know. That's, that's what we might call a messiah complex. If somebody goes and stands on Union Square in New York City and, I am the way, the truth, and the life, you know, follow me, and, and they think that it's actually a body that you're supposed to follow, or a personality, that's what we call a messiah complex in psychology. But, that presence, that state of mind, the Holy Spirit, I am the way, the truth, and the life, 
And the Holy Spirit, of course, goes by many different names in many different cultures. You know, it's not in India, it's not the Holy Spirit, and in China, and different places. But that presence of love is the way, the truth, and the life. <coughs> and so, you begin to open your mind to feel this expansive feeling where you just feel totally connected. You feel more like, in quantum physics terms, like the observer. You know, you feel this sense of calm, peace, detachment, uh, like you're watching everything, and at the same time you're simultaneously one with everything. So it's not like you're watching everything from a place that you're apart from it, but you're watching it from a unified perspective, which is quite a, you know, it's not a human perspective at all. Human beings don't, don't watch something and say, oh, that's me, literally. They tend to go to a movie theater and go, oh, I saw a movie today. But they don't think of their daily life experiences or their uh, everyday moment-by-moment -moment experiences as a movie. They tend to make that split again between a movie, oh, that's fiction, that's fantasy, that's make-believe. That has actors and actresses that are paid you know, by a movie studio to act things out. And yet, when they go to the movie, they have a lot of emotional reactions as if they're right there in the scene, you know, as if they're, it's really happening. As if they have, they leave the theater and they really are shook up sometimes, or sad, or they have all these emotions bubbling up after they've seen a, what they consider a very emotional movie, that they, they have engaged in the movie, and they have not seen the movie as a movie. So, so that's why it takes a lot of mind training, and we, we really emphasize, first of all, the metaphysics skill, working with the Course and really understanding clearly, clearly, clearly what it's teaching. Because the ego is frightened of those metaphysics, and you have to really go into them in a very open, careful way. And then the most part is like the workbook, the practical application of the principles, not making any exceptions to the principles. When you start to really apply the principles in every aspect of what seems to be your life and your world, that's when the joy starts to become more and more intense, because you free your mind from those pockets of exceptions. Okay, I can get this here and here and here and here, but I draw the line with this, this, this and that. I remember years ago I was in Roscoe up at the New York in the Catskill Mountains, and I happened to be doing a workshop on forgiveness with, with Ken and Gloria uh, the very week that the Persian Gulf War was really heating up, and I mean heating up by you know, scud missiles uh, <coughs> flying across and hitting Israel, uh, oil refineries getting blown up and flames going into the air, uh, Saddam Hussein getting on, you know, saying, God is with us, and George W. Bush, the, the first one, answering, no, God is on our side, <laughs> and, which is probably the most interesting thing of a war going on, and watching the religious and political leaders claiming God is on our side, you know, jihad, no, God is on us, I will show you. It's kind of like, it reminds me of watching the Ten Commandments with uh, Moses and the Pharaoh. My God's bigger than your God. Oh yeah? You want to see? <laughs> it's like showdown time. The God of Israel versus the Pharaoh. <laughs> this God, you know, if you watch it, it's kind of funny. It's like, you know, every time the Pharaoh thinks they've got Moses, like, put his staff in the water and the, all the water turns to blood. And, you know, I mean, it's just kind of one of these, it's Star Wars on Earth. <laughs> you know? but, but the thing about it, that Persian Gulf War, we were doing this, this seminar on forgiveness, and all during the week, I just was uh, sitting there and just really watching. I didn't have anything coming up, but I watched the participants because some of the participants started off in the week and they were really angry at Saddam Hussein. And then, as the week went on, they started to get angry at, at George Bush for his remarks, you know, read my lips. <laughs> They're like, <laughs> you know, the anger started coming up there. And then, the more the week went on, some people started to get angry at the media. Like, why is the media showing all this? Like, people aren't watching television shows anymore, they're watching scud missiles. You know, it was like drama. It was like watching soap opera, 
and the, it was taking up all the television time. They weren't having any programming. It was like war glorified so that everybody could go, oh my god, did you see that missile that landed there? And then they'd show the faces of all the people that were wounded, and then they'd show the political leaders. And so the people started to get angry at the media. Like, why, are the, why is the media wasting their time and energy putting such focus on this instead of other things? And one woman I watched went through the whole week, and she was just like me. She was just smiling and watching the whole thing, except on the very last day, the night before she had seen a news report and they showed a bird covered in oil on the beach from one of the refineries that had been blown up and the oil slick had drowned this bird in. And there was this bird carcass, this little bird carcass all draped in black. And she lost it. She was like, I'm angry at all the humans. Death to all the humans. How dare them do this to this bird. You know, fighting over oil and killing this. This bird was just flying around, probably just landed to go for a fish or something. And, you know, and turned into Darth Vader, you know. It's just, so she lost it. But, but to me, that was, it showed me the dynamics of projection, that underneath, as long as you still hold on to the ego, as long as you still believe that there's something real happening outside of the world, there's still that belief in victimization, and the ego needs a target. It can target Saddam, or George, or the media, or in the end it can tar target all human beings for what they did to the bird. Like, I'm mad at both sides, so to speak. I'm mad at the whole region, I'm mad at the whole planet for what happened to that bird. And that's just what projection is. It's trying to find a scapegoat. Trying to find something in form to get angry at, so that you don't have to look at the anger you have inside your mind that comes from believing that you can separate from God. So, for years, you know, a lot of us have books like the Bible where it seemed a bit, in the Old Testament, like, like God was quite human. I mean, God would get angry and zap a tribe or zap somebody, you know, that got out of line. And, you know, in more fancy terms, in, from ten years of university, we call that anthropomorphism, which is just assigning human characteristics to something that's not human. <laughs> and God is not human. So when we said, God is angry, or, I know the Christians, oh, they, uh, they get on this thing like, they, one of the things in the Bible is, is that God is a jealous God. And uh, recently I saw an interview with Oprah Winfrey where she was raised in a Baptist church and she was oh, all caught up in the flow and the dancing and the spirit and the minister was going on and on. And she was probably just a young woman, or maybe only... Uh, still a child, maybe like 12 years old or something like that, and she was all caught up in the whole thing at this Baptist church, and she was listening to the minister, and she heard the minister say, God is a jealous God. And Oprah said, she said she stopped, even at that age, and went, why is God jealous? If God is so powerful, and so all-encompassing, and omnipotent, and, you know, omniscient, and all, she even knew those words at that age, you know, if God is everything, why is God jealous? That was when she first started questioning her religion. You know, that God would be jealous. Jealous of what? <laughs> How could you be jealous if you're everything? You know, jealousy, she thought, that's really a human trait. And, and in the end, what you start to see is the same thing when you get down to that anger that's underneath, that, that if you have anger, you first have to come to an admission that you believe anger is real and justified. And if you follow that in even deeper, you believe in an angry God. Uh, because where is this anger supposed to come from? Uh, did it just, you know, pop into awareness suddenly from nowhere? What's the source of the anger? The ego covers itself and hides like a little spider in a web and projects out a big web to project that anger onto all these things in the world and keep it hidden. But the ego itself is where the anger is. It's where the, the fear is and the guilt. The ego is the fear, the guilt, the anger. So the ego is seemingly ingenious. It's, it doesn't really exist, but when it's given 
the power of the mind, it seems to be quite intelligent and ingenious. Uh, that's defined, you know, we always say military intelligence is, <laughs> is an oxymoron. Ego intelligence would be, again, kind of an oxymoron. But, but it does seem to be ingenious, Jesus says. And so what it does as part of its plan to cover itself is it makes up an angry God. Uh, it's the one that invented the angry God. You know, God will punish you. You've heard about that when, when they had a lot of AIDS outbreak, you know, there were pastors and ministers that were saying, God is punishing you for your lifestyle. You know, that's the punishment idea. A punishing God. And a punishing angry God is an ego invention. And, of course, the ego is, is going to come up with a, a substitute for the real God, because it has to. It doesn't really believe. It is the belief that there is no God. It is the denial of God. So it's going to come up and invent its own God. And that's why people even will get angry at God and start projecting their anger. Human beings will project their anger onto God as well. Because how could you do this to me? How could you leave me in this position? Or it's quite common to have anger projected onto Jesus or to spiritual uh, figures and messiahs and leaders like that, because um, even Helen Shuckman, the scribe of the Course, if you read some of her poetry, her book, The Gifts of God, you can see a lot of the anger and hurt coming up, a lot of feelings of abandonment. Why, how could you leave me here? Uh, you said, I am with you always, even unto the end of time. Where are you? Where are you in my life? Even though he was speaking to her, she had great difficulty opening her mind to his love. It was just the ego investment was made her very much afraid of that. And when Helen died, you know, she really did think that she had done a great job, and she did with a great job channeling and describing the Course. But Jesus did tell her at that point, the Course wasn't my gift to you. My gift to you is the love. The Course was just a symbol for us to use as a backdrop to heal the fear and the anger and the, the doubt. So it's never anything in form that's the gift. The gift is the love, and the form is just the tool or symbol that the human being can use to reach that love. And whenever you feel anger coming up, um, it's good to remember that anger is never justified, that it's not that you shouldn't, should or shouldn't feel anger, it's that whenever it arises, it's like when you notice that your mind is trying to justify the conditions. Well, look what they said to me. Well, they haven't called me back in two weeks, or you know, they stole the money. I, I got it. I have it on videotape. I have evidence. I've been walking out and stealing my wallet and my purse. What am I supposed to do? Not be angry? You know, that's not reasonable. Whenever you find yourself making a case for the anger to justify the anger then it's best to come back with those early course lessons, you know, like on 5, 6, 7, 8. You know, I'm never upset for the reason I think. I'm upset because I see something that's not there. I see only the past. You know, my mind is preoccupied with past thoughts. And you start to realize, oh yeah, it's these attack thoughts. This false identity, this crazy substitute identity that I made up, that, that I'm holding on to, that's where the anger's coming in. And uh, nobody really gets angry. It's, what I say is, you're not really angry. You're just feeling the ego's anger when you identify with it. And as soon as you pull your mind away from the ego, you don't feel angry anymore. Is the ego angry? Oh yes. It's, it's like doing a spiritual temper tantrum. You know how children sometimes when they get really upset will just go on the floor and just start wailing and banging or like your friend outside your apartment throwing trash. It's like the ego is having a, a temper tantrum. And if we had to define what that tantrum is, it's like the ego is saying, God, make my fantasy world real. And it's like, it's, lo it's throwing a tantrum over a millennium, <laughs> you know, of time and space saying, you make this cosmos real. But God wouldn't be God, if, because God is the God of eternity, so he's not going to make the, the ephemeral, the temporary, the what is limited, infinite. He's not going to make what is 
uh, lacking, fulfilled and complete, because God doesn't know of unfulfillment and incompletion. God is love, and love knows itself, but it doesn't know of illusions. The Holy Spirit in the Trinity is the one that, that sees the illusion but knows that it's not real. And that, that's why the Holy Spirit is our bridge back to God. But God does not know about time and space. So when you pray to God, you're really praying in Christian terms to the Holy Spirit. Like, help me see this differently. Help me release my mind from the belief that, that I really have been attacked, or that something really has gone wrong, so that I can wake up from this dream and remember God and the Creator. So that's, that little spiel I just gave, that incorporates not only the metaphysics that we're teaching, but also the practical application. That isn't it great whenever you feel upset, angry, fearful, shameful, guilty, nervous, anxious, whatever the upset is, it doesn't matter the degree or the direction of the upset, uh, you Sense always... Direction? Yeah, but. direction can be aimed at, at what seems to be the self, mm. the, the personality self, or it can be aimed at any one of the other images mm. in the cosmos. It doesn't matter the degree, the rage, or the annoyance or the direction of, it's your fault over there, it's, it's Saddam Hussein's fault, it's Osama Bin Laden's fault, or it's my fault as a body. It's, it's just aiming the ray gun. Where am I going to fire? What am I going to zap? And then you have to bring it in and just and really be willing to let go of those attack thoughts, because those attack thoughts are keeping you from experiencing peace. And the trick is to try to not see them as attack thoughts, but projection is a trick to seem to say, no, there is an image, a situation, a person, a country, something outside of my mind, it's doing it to me, apart from my will. So that I'm completely innocent, and I have no part in it, and they're doing it to me. That's the ego's trick, you know, and every time you feel justifiably upset, You've stepped right onto the ego's playing field and you've bought the bait. Hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> and you sink. <laughs> you seem to sink in awareness when you take a bite out of that, uh, that bite. It could be the opposite to that, like, uh, I am doing this to someone else. Yes. It would be the same thing, yeah? yes? Yes. Or did. I did this to somebody else. Mm -hmm. I will never be able to forgive myself mm -hmm. for what I said for what I did, for what I didn't do, for the way I, I abdicated and, and didn't follow through on a duty, a commitment, a promise, you know, it's the guilt, the same way. Mm -hmm. Everyone seems to have it wired up a little different, but it's the same core. You, Hi, Asa. So whenever you make a decision, it really doesn't matter like what that decision is. It's the guilt and the reaction that you feel from it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, and, and we could say that it doesn't so much matter. We're going back to what you said at the beginning. You do start to find that it doesn't so much matter the form of the decision. But if we bring it back to content, the two decisions that we're dealing with on a daily, daily basis is the right mind and the wrong mind, Jesus calls. So a right-minded decision is has no guilt with it. It's it's joyful, it's peaceful, it's loving, free, happy. It's it's a it's a decision you make with the Holy Spirit. And a wrong-minded decision, again, it's not so much mattering what the particular form is. It's, it's that you're looking through a darkened glass, like the Bible says, you know, in Corinthians. You're looking through a dark lens, and that's the decision that is so obscure. That's why when we practice the Course, it's like, what are you talking about? I can't tell the difference between the right mind and the wrong mind. That's, that's a common admission, you know, when you work with the Course. And it may be that you could work with the Course for years or decades and still have difficulty deciding, knowing when you're right-minded or wrong-minded. Because the resistance to that discern, discernment and the clarity is the ego's resistance to being undone. The ego thinks it will be obliterated, destroyed, if you get clear on that, that distinction. So I've spent my whole life going into that distinction 
and then teaching what I would learn in many seeming different situations. So world travels, meeting teachers, students, people, this body's been knocked down to the ground. Uh, all, you know, as I've gone around the world, instead of just sitting in, in my couch in my house and just meditating, trying to meditate the ego away, I decided I would follow the Holy Spirit and it has led to a little bit of a knockdown drag out a couple of times, but I could share those parables. Those all got used too for me to really see that, oh, it's it's my mind. It's just a mental issue that's going on. And I also see a tight connection between judgment and decision. Yes. Okay. Decision seems very very close to judgment and, and whether ego ego doesn't necessarily have to be there, whether you wear a blue shirt or a red shirt, the ego wasn't in that. But if you happen to have some sexy provocative shirt on, that would be an ego picking that shirt would be an ego decision. But I, I, and then there's the judgment in there. Judgment, I have, can you just talk a little bit about distinguishing yeah. decision and judgment? Yeah. Well, let's use the idea of the, the blue shirt, the green shirt, or like a provocative shirt or blouse or something. Because that kind of gets to the thing like, well, where do you draw the line? Where, what's a judgment and what's not a judgment? The blue shirt is a judgment. Uh, even the blue shirt is a judgment. In fact, I I did a, a gathering one time in Florida where I had a little bottle with a little blue bottle cap. And I said, now, if you can follow me and understand what I'm going to teach you about this little blue bottle cap, it will unleash your mind. It will unlock all the mysteries of the universe in this one little blue bottle cap. But we can do use a blue shirt because we don't have a blue bottle cap available for that. If the blue shirt, how is the blue shirt a judgment? You know, most people think, no, I'm being very objective. I'm just objectively describing a blue shirt. Well, first of all, no two people see the same world, and so you could not find universal agreement. If you went across all the cultures, not even accounting for language differences, you went to China and Asia and South America, Australia, and all the way around North America, and you and you lined up ten, a hundred thousand people, and you said, okay. We're going to do a simple experiment today. This is David. Hi, David. Uh, David's wearing a shirt. You can use di translate to different languages so they all know what we're talking about. Simple question, what color is David's shirt? Fill out the form. You would not get 100% uniformity on the answer to that question. But you'd probably have some colorblind people <laughs> that were in the audience. They go, Great. <laughs> in Chinese, great. <laughs> or whatever. So, so if you don't get 100% uniformity in the answer, it's not true. You know, we read in the Course, the truth is true, and only the truth is true, and the truth is always true. The truth is never not true. Uh, so it, that's just a good experiment to show that perception is relative. No two people see the same world. So. Yes, blue shirt is actually a judgment, and it's actually an ego judgment. It doesn't seem like like World War III is going to erupt over, ah, no, it is not blue, it's azure, <laughs> you know, or something, no, we say it's not azure, you know, that, okay, fight, <laughs> no, it's not that there's going to be a fight breaking out over the color of the shirt, but the blue shirt is taking a symbol out of all the images of the whole cosmos, the whole tapestry of all time and space. When you pull one image out, which we call it the shirt, and you call it blue, it doesn't matter what you label it, and you give it a, a size and a shape, maybe it's a large, or and maybe it's, it's cotton or polyester, you know, here we go. This object, this image, now we start to give labels to. This is what the ego does. It, it has invented a fragmented world, and it names and labels the fragments. And as you read in the course, in the workbook, it tries to carve them out of reality. Uh, if you read lesson, we could go through a course workbook lesson that would really uh, get it. It's lesson 184. Uh, where he literally describes the whole process of labeling separate things 
and giving them names and carving them out of reality. And in this sense, he says, you make fragments of a whole that are really not there. If the whole is whole, we could say, it would be like having a jigsaw puzzle, and when the puzzle's all made, you see the whole picture. But it would be like taking out one little piece in the middle of the jigsaw puzzle, and that would be, we'll call it the blue shirt, and going, look at this, look what I found. There was a blue shirt in that puzzle. And Jesus is saying, never happened. It's not, it doesn't have any reality. So this, I want to share that example with you using your question to show you how subtle. Now, let's be practical. I had a, a, a philosopher, one time I was in Florida, and we got on the topic of judgment, and I was at a Unity Church, and we were talking about, I spoke at the service, and we were having a big lunch together. And his, man, his name was Fred, and he was a philosophy professor who had gone to the course group several times. And the people at the course group hated this man, hated this philosopher, because he would ask all these deep questions about, well, wait a minute, is it, what about judgment? How can we practically not judge? He would bring this up as a philosophy professor, and the group would, couldn't answer his questions the deeper he got, and they chased him out of the group. They would not let him come to the course group. So I'm at this big table at this Unity Church, and I don't know this at the time, but Fred, the man, is sitting across from me. And he's talking to me, and we're eating, and I said, Oh, Fred, they've invited me to the course group on Wednesday night. Why don't you come? And the whole table at a Unity Church groaned. <laughs> they all oh. Like, like, oh, you've crossed the line, David. You've done, you've done a terrible thing. Oh, Fred has been invited back to the group. We thought we got rid of it to Fred, but David's invited him now. And I said, what? What? Like in the I Heart Huckabees, what, 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 what's, what's going on here? They said, you don't understand, David. Fred is a philosophy professor at the local university. He gets into these deep discussions, and we cannot answer his questions. We can't even find stuff in the course that answers his questions. It's just, it, he asks his questions about judgment, and how do you live practically, and how can you live without judgment, and all this and that. I, I think they're really good questions. I, the Holy Spirit, I would put the same questions to the Holy Spirit, and I did put the same questions to the Holy Spirit. I studied philosophy, too, in college, so I, I could identify with Fred. So, I said, Fred, come. And everyone, oh. So Fred, I said, come, come. So we did. He came. Uh, it was a room full of people and everything. Fred was there. But Fred had been, he perceived himself as so attacked by this course group, that's why he hadn't come back there, that he, he was quiet. Mum's the word. He was, he's like, uh, he just was not speaking up. So we go the whole first half of the gathering, and Fred doesn't say one word or ask one question. He made it into the house, but he's just sitting there among them, but he's like got his lips sealed. So then we take a break, like we usually do, have some tea, have some cookies, and then, you know, I went up to Fred and I said, Fred, this is a golden opportunity. Launch, launch all your questions. The Holy Spirit's with us right now. We call on the Holy Spirit. It will be a blessing to everybody. These are deep questions, but the Holy Spirit's right here with us, ready to answer your every single question and everything. And so I really had to encourage him during the break. So he did. He launched all his major questions, all of them, in the second half of the gathering, and the Holy Spirit came ripping through in a spectacular way, which we'll talk about the answer to the question about judgment. And at the end of the gathering, Everybody was in such a state of stillness, it was like peace had descended on all of us. And everybody was just silent and eye-gazing, just like everybody was looking around, connecting with everyone's eyes, because the presence of love was so strong. Fred had helped initiate this by not people-pleasing and by launching his questions. And then the little dog, they had a dog called Sparkles, came in with the tail wagging, and he went around and he individually looked in the eyes of everybody in the room with his little tail going, sparkles, was sparkling, almost that going, now you're getting it, it's probably the first <laughs> Course in Miracles meeting he's ever been to, the dog, where he felt the humans had reached the same state <laughs> that he was in. You know, dog is God backwards, you know, the dog sparkles, like looking at everybody going, 
hey, you got it, finally, you know, it took you a long time of bantering around with that blue book, but you finally, and, so it was so good, but, but what Fred's question was, was he had actually come up to me uh, on Sunday, and he said to me, uh, at one point he said, David, let's be practical. You talk about love and forgiveness and joy and happiness, and he said, but you're traveling with this woman, Beverly. And Beverly was right next to me, and, and Fred said, now, practically speaking, if you're walking down the street with Beverly, and somebody comes up with a knife and grabs a hold of Beverly and puts a knife, this is the philosopher, <laughs> puts a knife to Beverly's neck, don't tell me you're going to be meek like Jesus, and you're going to be totally gentle and loving, and look at this man, and gaze at this man with loving eyes of perfection, and see his perfection and innocence. When the guy has grabbed Beverly and put a knife to Beverly's uh, neck, you're going, to, you're going to do something. You're going to defend her. You're going to do something. Like, you're not going to let your failed companion do this. So he said, that's my question. This was before we even got to the group. These are the kind of questions you would have. And I said, oh, Fred, thank you for that question. Please ask that question at the group on Wednesday night for everyone's benefit. He said, and it's a hypothetical. And Fred was like, hypothetical? And I said, yeah, it's a hypothetical question. It's an as-if question. We have to start to look at hypothetical questions. Where are the hypotheticals coming from? You know, and and do you believe in hypotheticals? He was like, <laughs> so, so I said, ah, ask your question and we'll go into the whole idea of hypotheticals. Because that, if you can understand what hypotheticals are, and if you can understand that everything that you think about the past or the future is hypothetical, assumes that you believe cause and effect are a part, assumes that you believe in lots of potential possible outcomes, it's all denying the present moment. Time was made to, des to deny the power of now. Time was made to deny the holy instant, the present moment of release. All thoughts about the future and all thoughts about the past are hypothetical, including grabbing Beverly and sticking a knife to her neck and then asking me, what would you do in the what? In the future, if there were a hypothetical situation when this happened? So, I mean, I'm, when people ask me questions, there's no tough questions, you know. Some people would say, ooh, that's a tough one for David. Mm -hmm. He's going to have to think a couple seconds on answering that one. It's like, oh no, let's come bring your question and we'll get into some real deep teachings there. And he did. Then, the, then he asked the question of judgment, which, which is what your question is. It's like, where, what is judgment? So first I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what judgment seems to be and how it seemed to arise. In other words, in the kingdom of heaven, which is perfect oneness and perfect love, there is no judgment. Uh, what would you judge between them? Uh, if everything is just pure oneness and abstract love and light, there is no judgment in heaven. Maybe that's why in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said very simply, judge not. That's the shortest sermon. <laughs> if you wanted to take all of the teachings of Jesus and boil them down, just go to the, the Sermon on the Mount and take that one little two words, judge not. Well, that would do it right there. Then he puts, lest ye be judged. So he's saying, it's like a boomerang effect. If you judge, you will feel judged. And it's not going to feel good. That's why he was saying, judge not. If you want to feel the love, judge not. So that's a real short summation of, of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, what is judgment? When the mind believed that it could separate from God, uh, that would be a judgment. Uh, when the mind projected out a cosmos of time and space and stars and planets and black holes, it invented a device to keep the illusion or the projection in place. It's just a, a construct, but it also invented a device to make the illusion seem real. And what that device is, is judgment. To the Holy Spirit, the projection of the world is not a problem. The Holy Spirit answered that, like, is that all you can do? 
Is that the best you can do? <coughs> Take care of that in an instant. But the ego is like, oh, something just happened here. My whole defense mechanism was just, something happened to it. It was totally reinterpreted the instant that it seemed to occur. So the ego immediately went on the offensive, defensive, and said, oh, i got to do something with all these images now that I made up. Uh, I will fragment the pictures. You were, we were talking about like a glass that was fragmented over and over, a mirror that was fractured and fragmented. It took the images and it started to arrange them into hierarchies and patterns. So that was how it, it just defended its projection. Oh, if I make hierarchies, then it will seem like some are more important than others. And therefore, it will make the whole thing seem real. And that's why the very first principle of A Course in Miracles, of the 50 Miracle Principles, is that there are no hierarchies of miracles. There's no order of difficulty in miracles, is the way it's actually stated. And the ego, its very first premise of its 50 unholy principles would be, there is a hierarchy of difficulties. There are separate things, like blue shirts, there are separate objects and images, and among those separate objects and images, they can be arranged into hierarchies, into degrees, into gradations, into levels. You know, it made up all of these gradations and levels to keep the illusion seeming to be more than an illusion. So this is why you have stories of people working with the Course in Miracles where they they read through some of the texts, they start doing the workbook lessons, and they start on lesson one, nothing I see means anything, and he says, gently let your eyes move around the room, you know, he gives you things, look at the, the chair and the table, and, you know, move around the room and all this and that, and try not to make any exceptions to the lesson of the day. I've heard stories of people, they'll go around the room, this couch does not mean anything, this shoes do not mean anything, that fan does not mean anything. And then they look over on their coffee table, and it's their family photo. <laughs> and, yeah, the Kleenex box does not mean anything. There's a famous story with Ken Wabnick where he was visiting a group of nuns one time, and he was in New England somewhere, and, and he went there, and they were all, these nuns were reading the Course in Miracles book, and they're all excited, and, and they were going through some of the early workbook lessons, like, Know, nothing I see means anything, and so forth, and, and working around. And they were going around the church where they were, and they were, you know, going with the stained glass window. The stained glass window does not mean anything. The pulpit does not mean anything. The pews do not mean anything. The carpet does not mean anything. And then they came up to the Eucharist. <laughs> they were, oh, we'll skip that. <laughs> the body of Christ. <laughs> They're not. <laughs> They weren't really in the position to say the body of Christ, the Eucharist, it does not mean anything. You see, that's what we mean about the transfer of training. When someone, you have a self-concept and you have an identity attachment to a child on a photo or a husband or a wife or something in form or the Eucharist or, you know, fill in the blank with whatever you have in your mind, that's where the ego's like going, uh, whoa, 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 whoa. We're not taking it that far. We want miracles, but not that bad. <laughs> we don't want we don't want the miracles that much, and we don't want the atonement. And if the atonement means I have to be completely wrong about everything that I have have believed in with the ego, then that seems like it's like that section uh, where Jesus talks about that in the teacher's manual. How is healing accomplished? You know. Healing, what will healing cost you? It costs you the whole world you see, he says in that section, in the teacher's meeting. The whole world you see, because how would I, how would I see a blue shirt if my mind was healed? I would see the whole world in a different way if my mind was not following the ego. I wasn't looking through the ego's filter. So then people ask, the next question is, practically speaking then, David, do you still see blue shirts? Uh, do your eye, body's eyes still perceive it? And what it is, is, is like, 
I always quote that part from the teacher's manual where it says, the body's eyes will continue to report differences, but the healed mind will put them into one category. They are unreal. It's simply, forgiveness is simply reaching a state where you realize it's that all the boxes, all the fragments, all the labels, man, woman, Jew, Arab, you know, Hindu, uh, all the different labels, including the names, you know, how we were talking the other day about when you start to forget what day it is, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and you might feel, oh, uh oh, I better watch it, I'm losing it. Or when you start to forget people's names, uh, uh oh, this spiritual journey cannot be good. I'm, I'm losing track of, of people's names, I can't remember the name. You can just, again, realize that you're on the right track and that if you need to know a name, the Holy Spirit will give it to you. If it's part of an interaction, a friendly interaction, and you're walking up to somebody and you're going, you need a name here, if it's helpful, and the Holy Spirit goes, Frank. <laughs> Frank. <laughs> but if, if you don't get a Frank, it's like, hey! <laughs> You know, it's, you're given what you need to serve the plan. The Holy Spirit is giving you the symbols of what serves. So you don't even personally have to be responsible for remembering anything. It's like I've got this pool of all of time and space, I feel like, it's in my mind. And when I'm in these gatherings, I don't think what I'm going to talk about. I don't premeditate things. It's all very spontaneous in the moment. Right now, these words are being given to me by the Holy Spirit. They're just flowing spontaneously. There's not a pause or there's not a, a wondering what to say. It's just being given very authentically, very simply from the Holy Spirit. And it's a blessing because of the purpose from which it's coming from. There's nothing special about the words. You don't have to be a great orator, a great speech maker to be uh, a teacher of God. He said that yesterday, a teacher of God can heal the world without a sound. That's a great idea from the teacher's manual. You can just reach a state of certainty and stillness in your mind and heal the whole universe just from that. But this is really, I mean, I, I, in the early years when I was traveling and speaking, someone would ask a question and they were asking the question at the gathering. It was almost like a spool, you know, the old days when you had the old sewing machines, with the little singer, the little spool up there. I could feel as they were asking the question, the answer was spooling up, mm. like from the Holy Spirit. And then I'd be like pulling on the, on the thread, like here it comes, and watching it. That's good. I'm going to have to remember that. Oh, very good, very good. It was, that's the way that it felt with all these questions. It wasn't like, uh oh, a question that's hard to answer. It was like, no, the spool is there. And then I would like be hearing the spool for the first time. You know, because ultimately that's it was for me. Mm -hmm. It really we're never answering anybody else's question. When somebody asks us a question, it's really for our own benefit. 